affection on us so that we are now one in him. Let's sing this together. I need rescue. My sin was heavy, but James prayed at the weight of your glory. I need a shelter. I was an orphan. Now you call me a sinner, sinner.
Lord for that truth.
For my life he bled and died Christ will hold me fast Justice has been satisfied He will hold me fast Raised with him to endless life He will hold me fast Till our faith is turned to side When he comes at last He will hold me fast He will hold me fast Good morning. Good morning. We come to that time in our worship service where we get to worship God through our giving. We have several ways you can do that. We have a traditional way where we pass the plates. We have the boxes along the walls here as well. You can use those. And for those of you watching online, please use the prompts on your set as you watch it, Lord. And we thank you, Father, for watching over us this morning. Heavenly Father, we ask you to bless this time together. Now I would like to read the Word of God to you this morning from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. Uh, chapter 1, verse 18 to 25. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are called the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. You may be seated. May we go to the Lord in prayer now. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you, Lord, to worship you and to draw near to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, for your grace, for your mercy through Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for our church and the many people that come here to hear the word and worship collectively together in this special place. Please bless those who cannot be with us today with your comfort, your strength, and bless Pastor Scott as he opens the word of God together and begins to explain and exegete the scripture to us. May we take what is taught to us today and place it upon our hearts so each of us can better serve you by being imitators of Christ in our daily lives. We pray all this in the precious name of Jesus, our maker and our redeemer, our savior in Jesus' name, amen.
If you are saved, the goodness of God is pursuing you. I think that verse was telling us. Do you believe that? Yes. God is good and he loves his children. Well, it's good to be back. We returned from the occupied states, uh, back to the free. Uh, what a blessing to go out west, see lots of family. And uh, good news to report, the church that's preaching the word of God is thriving out west. They're doing well, despite all the restrictions and all that. Praise the Lord for those faithful churches out there. We had a great trip, but it's always good to come home. We missed you. We love being with our church family. Uh, a couple of announcements. Um, just want to congratulate the graduates. We were not able to be here because we had family weddings to get to. Um, and, uh, but we watched online. And praise the Lord for our graduates. God's doing wonderful things in our school. And we're excited to see what God's going to do with those young people. Um, tonight we have a gathering, a men's gathering. It's for all those who have been involved with our soul care ministry. We started a new discipleship that we've been testing. And so we have a dinner tonight at 6. Uh, men, make sure you come and be a part of that. We are going to talk about that and work out the details and make it even better. Um, just lots of events. You need to check your bulletins. There's summer camp starting. Our kids are leaving for camp next week. Uh, Gene and I will be following them after church going up there and be teaching. We're looking forward to that. On Father's Day, there's a free breakfast for everyone. There's basketball camp coming, membership classes, there's a summer picnic, and there's over 200 kids signed up for VBS already. So uh, we're excited about all of those things. Um, besides that, there was a new baby born to um, uh, the, the uh, Giaquinto family. Uh, John and uh, Deborah had a new baby yesterday, a new, brand new baby boy, Benjamin. Uh, so grateful for that, to so praise the Lord. I do want to share some that's a little sad and uh, hard, hard uh, message I got while I was away. As you know, we're very involved in the Philippines. Um, Philippines is a ministry I personally have been involved with for many, many years, and Pastor Nilo is a dear friend of mine. He sent me a message last Sunday that one of the pastors had been shot and killed. Um, a lot of our funds that have been given to this church and our missions, we have sent down there. We've been building seminaries and Bible schools in very, some very difficult places. One is with the Tabuli tribe. And over the last year or so, they've sent several teams in there to teach at the Bible school and plant churches to this tribe that has been completely unreached for forever. Um, but it is a strong Muslim uh, holding ground there. And um, last Sunday evening, uh, Marlon Tagonge um, is the pastor. I actually have met him. Um, he had preached that morning in the little church that's established up in that hill country. There's no roads, and it's all walking into this tribe. Um, and then that evening, he was um, just, they have just little grass huts that they live, live in, and he was sitting in his home preparing to, to teach to his family, doing family devotions that night, and somebody walked in behind him and shot him point blank. Um, they don't know who it is. They know it's from the tribe there somewhere. He leaves behind him a precious little wife and three kids. Um, Nilo said that they're committed to taking care of that family. They've moved them back to the Central Seminary, and there they're ministering to that family. But um, they need our prayers. Um, it is a tremendous ministry. I have been all around the world. Uh, that ministry, I've watched the hand of God do things that are just miraculous. Uh, how many people have come to know the Lord Gina and I were supposed to be there in August. That trip has been postponed. Uh, we're going to go next year. Um, but I long to be with them and to minister to them and care for them. So will you join me in prayer as we start our time in the Word, as we pray for these dear people? Lord, our hearts are heavy when we think about the loss of uh, such a dear loved one. Uh, uh, one of your under-shepherds, Lord. One of your men that was trained by Paul's. Uh, he's a Timothy to someone, Lord, who was sent out. Uh, this man loved you, he loved the Lord, and yet you and your providence allowed this to take place and you brought him home. We do beg you for comfort for his wife and his three children. Lord, we pray for those little ones. Doubtlessly, this is very difficult for them to get their minds around. We ask that you would comfort them. Give Nilo and the elders of Sola Gracia Ministries wisdom, Lord, as they care for this young family. Father, we pray for the Taboli tribe. We pray particularly for whoever this was who committed murder, Lord, that he would be brought to justice, but more important, Lord, that he'd be saved. Um, and Lord, we pray, and I know this is the prayer of Sola Gracia, that your work would not be delayed up there. This is a place, Lord, that we believe you, you want the gospel to go. And so 
Please protect the rest of those pastors and their families who are in there. We pray for the man who will replace uh, Tagange. Lord, that you would bring in the right man who would be unashamed of the gospel and, and he would have strength, Lord, and he would not fear and he would go in there and preach truth, Lord. Lord, thank you for hearing our prayers, Lord. We thank you for a uh, new life, um, Giaquinto baby, Lord. We thank you for all the other families that have had children this year. We thank you for those who can be with us today, first and second services, all filling up, Lord, as your people come to worship. But Lord, we do pray for those who are not here, Lord. We particularly pray for Wayne Guest as he is preparing for surgery. Lord, please protect him, give him strength, Lord. Others that are going through procedures and maybe struggling with illnesses, Lord, help them know we love them, Lord. Thank you for those who are watching online that for one reason or another couldn't be here with us personally, Lord. We ask that you bless them, Lord. Father, your word is worthy of our attention, so we ask that you would gather our hearts and minds and focus it on your truth now. In Jesus' name, amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 says this, The word of the cross is foolish to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Well, three Sundays ago, I ventured into this passage and just got through this single verse. But we're beginning to see already that Paul is setting a contrast, a great contrast, between human wisdom and the wisdom of God. When Paul speaks of foolishness, he's referring to the love of human wisdom. Man loves his wisdom. Right? We can hear it all the time, right? They're always telling us what they know. And so Paul is going to contrast that wisdom that human fallen philosophy of the day with the all-sufficient word of God, the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, as we remember, this ancient Greek culture loved their philosophy. But the problem is, as we learned in verses 11 <coughs> excuse me, through 13, that this worldly philosophy, this arrogant kind of thinking, this articulation of, of truth that they prided themselves on had made its way into the church. <coughs> Excuse me. It's also clear that the Corinth church um, put a great emphasis on that. And we know that because Paul's going to say in the next chapter when we get there in chapter 2, they said, I did not come with superior, superiority of speech. He goes, if you're looking for that, if you're, you're looking toward the oracle, orators of the day, these great men of philosophy and speech, that's not what I'm coming with. But I am coming with the cross of Christ. And so we realize that the church had fallen into this pursuit of human wisdom and human proclamation. The culture of the day had, had no absolute truth to stand on, and it was just one philosopher after another philosopher trying to outdo themselves and, of course, the Corinth church bought into that, and it was a source of many of their problems. Just like today, man does not have a basis for right and wrong outside of the Scriptures. You know that, don't you? There is no absolute truth in the world. They don't believe in absolute truth. We, as Christians, those who follow the Lord Jesus Christ, believe in absolute truth. We stand on the Word of God. What the world has is their human ideology. That's all that can guide them to make their decisions. And this is why they come up with things like critical race theory and so forth, stuff that just pulls people away from the true gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. They are bound to the world's wisdom. But the church doesn't have to be that way. We have the very word of God that we can hold on. And though we have it, the church still struggles today. We see it in the prosperity gospel and so many weak or false churches that are out there, they struggle with the effects of human wisdom. And so they won't land on a single interpretation of the scripture. They won't hold to the all-sufficient word of God. They don't believe it to be infallible. And so they look to man's wisdom. And so there is much uh, disunity among the church. But here we know that we're inundated with worldly philosophies. You can't go throughout the day without hearing um, the world barking about something, uh, whether it's religion or politics or social issues or economics or education. These things are always coming at you, and they're not based in the Word of God. Many Christians have fallen into that trap. 
And I love this text because it teaches us that we do not integrate worldly wisdom with the Word of God. I do not study the papers and all the, all the events of the day and put my sermon together and come that way. I spend my time studying God's Word. It is the absolute truth in the infallible scriptures, the, insu- the all-sufficient scriptures of God that we stand on, not the insufficient truth of human wisdom. Well, the scriptures bring us to understand the divine work of God. And I, I love verse 18. There it says the message, the word of the cross is foolish to those who are perishing. But there's a great conjunction there. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. So that excites us as Christians. On your lap is the word of God that leads you to the cross of God, which is the power of God. What an amazing truth that is given to us. And so... We look for the answers of life where? Anybody awake? (laughs) In the Word of God. We don't look to the answers of life from from Pfizer (laughs) or anyone else or from the social media. We look to answers of life through the Word of God. We understand where we came from through the Word of God. We understand where we're going through the Word of God. We understand why we're here why we live and die even through the Word of God. It's all sufficient. It has everything we need for life and godliness. And those who look for salvation or anything else will find themselves on the wrong side of the Scriptures. They'll find themselves looking to the Scriptures as foolishness. Fallen human wisdom does not have the answers. And Paul wants to make that clear. Now... When you're looking for the meaning of happiness and joy, it's amazing. What Paul does is he takes us through the death of Christ. You're looking for meaningness and happiness and joy, and you're looking for fulfillment and peace in your life. Paul says that will only be found in Jesus Christ crucified. See why it's foolish to the world? See, if you don't have the Spirit of God, you go... I want fulfillment in life, and I have to look to someone who died on a cross? This doesn't make sense. Can you imagine hearing that without the Spirit of God? Can you imagine hearing that without the Spirit of God, taking the Word of God and helping us understand the whole process of God's plan of salvation from before eternity and His biblical theology that everything flowed towards the cross and then everything flows as a result of the cross? Can you imagine trying to understand that? See, that's why Spirit saves and not us. God opens people's heart to understand And we start to look, salvation, we look beyond human wisdom. And we see the glories of Christ in the word of God. So we must look. We have no other place to look except the absolute truth found in the word of God. And each and every time it leads you back to the cross. It is essential truth. Now, last time we were together, we looked at a couple of thoughts. One, we said the cross of Christ is foolish to the perishing. Well, Paul knew this. He knew the dangers of men attempting to prove their wisdom, resulting in a lowering view of God. So, so what he means by this is the, the, the cross is foolishness to man because man looks at the cross and he tries to figure out some way to get to God other than the cross. So he looks at the cross and he says, that's foolish. I'm a good person. I haven't murdered. I've, I've been good. I've given money. I even make an appearance on Christmas and Easter at a church. I'm a good person. And so he's contrasting this to help them understand that they de-elevate God by rejecting his one and only plan for salvation, and they elevate themselves thinking they have a better way. This is going to be his argument all the way through the scriptures. See, Paul understood depravity. Depravity says, I don't need God. When you're lost in your sins and you're dead in your sins, you don't need God. You see him as a crutch, and you often tell Christians, oh, you have a crutch in Christ. But so he knows depravity, and he knows that when he comes to scriptures, he understands when it comes to the cross, they will think this is pure foolishness. You remember we talked about this word foolish, that the Greek word meant moronic. In fact, that's where we get our English word from there, meaning it's absolutely nonsense to them. So you can read it this way. The word or the message of the cross is moronic to those who are dying eternally. That's how they'll live. That's how they'll die. That's how they'll spend 
eternity, the Bible tells us. The message of the cross is powerful to the saved. To the perishing, it's just moronic. It's absolutely nonsense. Paul was communicating to us here in this verse. Now, clearly, Paul's contrasting. He's making a great contrast between man's words and sinful use, uh, their, their sinful use of man's wisdom in comparison to the words of God. Now, his word has clearly described how the relationship works. You come to him through the cross. And when we look at the cross, I said this last time, the cross is the pinnacle of the scriptures. The plan of God is laid down before the foundations of the world. He knows each and every believer. He knows each and every person. He sends his son in the, in, in the pinnacle of all of this as he points to them through Old Testament sacrifice and law and prophets. Everything's pointing towards the Christ. And he is the pinnacle of all of the scriptures. And then everything that comes from that pinnacle flows forward to eternity. And that's how we live our lives now as Christians. And so Paul says, the cross of Christ reveals the power of God. Notice in the end of the verse. For the first half, it's foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those who are being saved, it's the power of God. It's what God is doing. We sang that beautiful verse today, didn't we? John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son. I, I could hear you singing behind me with great joy. Because you love that truth. That God loved you. He had a plan for you. And his plan was to send his son. Not, not some other human way. Well, I'll send my son and then maybe I'll give him a few other options. <laughs> no, no. We love that verse because God tells us he loved us. And he gave his only begotten son. And whoever believes in him, whoever that elect is, whoever God has chosen from the foundations of the world will come to him. He, they will not be rejected. They will come. And we find such hope in that. And we see the power of God in that. So the power of God is being contrast with human foolishness, human wisdom here throughout this text. Now, there's a couple of things that really cause you to uh, be encouraged in that last part of verse 18. The saved are the called, and those are the ones who believe. And they see that their very present existence is the result of the power of God. If you're saved today, you should see that you're saved because God is powerful. Do you? Or do you hold, uh, I walked an aisle, I prayed a prayer, or I checked a box on a little envelope or something like that? No, you're saved because God is powerful. He beats sin. He beats death. Think about that, how powerful he is. You're saved because of that. And then he goes on to talk about this effectual work of God, right? The cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ has not only changed our eternal destiny, they changed our minds and our hearts, and we live forever. And the Bible says we are being saved. And so he brings into this understanding that there's a point in our past where we are saved. Right now, he's keeping us saved. And then in the future, he will always keep us saved. That's pretty powerful. I mean, you, mom and dad, you've ever had your kids when they were little and say, you know, if you run off there, I can't protect you. I, I, can't, I can't, if you make that decision, you go over there, I can't be there with you, I can't protect you. See, that's not true of the Christian. Wherever we go, God protects us at the time of salvation, throughout salvation, and all the way into eternity. God is there, and we trust his power. We also noted the beautiful pronouns that are, in, that are in this verse, but to us. And I remember we talked about this. It's so personal, isn't it? Salvation is so personal. But to us. <laughs> now, there's others that see the cross just as foolishness. What? i got to believe in a dead Jesus? Makes no sense to them. But to us, <laughs> it's so personal, isn't it? We talk about personal salvation. People don't, they're not personally saved. They have, a, they have an external or a distant relationship with God through their religious circumstances of some sort. To us, it's personal, right? To us who are being saved, this is us. We know who we are. Jesus has changed our life. It is the power of God. And you go, well, why is that? Because when you've been dead and made alive, you know who did that to you. When you are blind and all of a sudden you can see clearly, oh, you know who did that. When you are lost with no hope and God saved you, you know who found you. See, you see the power 
of God. See, the natural man, he has no spirit. And so he doesn't understand these things, and the cross is just merely foolishness to him. Now, these next set of verses, and I want to attempt to get through this morning, all are to support this argument. Paul is going to support this argument with, with all these different verses as we look down through here. So in your notes, number one, God will destroy the fallacy of human wisdom. God will destroy the fallacy of human wisdom. For the word of the cross is foolish to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Well, to prove his point, Paul takes us to Isaiah chapter 29, verse 14. It's a verse in a context that Isaiah is speaking about something that God had done in the past there. Now, when you study Isaiah chapter 29, there's a future fulfillment that will happen later. But Paul is using this argument to bring us back to a circumstance that seemed impossible and God showed his power. What that text is referring to is 2 Kings chapter 17 through 19. You'll remember this, that Assyria had become the superpower of the world. They had already crushed the northern tribes of Israel. They had taken them into captivity. And now they're pressing in on Judah. King Hezekiah is the king at the time. He is a godly man. He follows in the ways of David and searches the things of the Lord. And there, Sennacherib, who is the king of Assyria, has now threatened to destroy them. And he sent his messenger, who stands on a canal wall in Israel and mocks God and the nation. If you read that passage, you'll see there he talks about and touts the great things of the nation of Assyria and how strong they are. He talks about how they crushed all these other nations and their gods couldn't protect them and will crush you and your God won't protect you. He's mocking the true and living God. Well, it's a beautiful thing because Hezekiah, <laughs> he looks at the situation and he goes, I can't, I can't defend against these people. This is the superpower. We're, we're down to two tribes. We're a small nation. There's no way we can stop this. And Hezekiah does what any believer who puts his faith in God alone does. He prays, and that prayer is worth studying. And he goes in and prostrates himself before God and pleads and begs for God's deliverance. He knows that he has no power on his own to save. You know God does that night? You know the story, don't you? 185,000 soldiers sitting outside the gates of Israel. He sends an angel, and he flicks his hand and wipes out 185,000 men in one night. Isn't that interesting? Here, Sennacherib and his messengers all mocking God, mocking the nation of Israel, all with their clever speech. When you read the speech of this uh, Ramshake as he comes and makes it, he, he thinks he has all the wisdom. He thinks he has all the cleverness. And so here Apostle Paul brings that story out and says, I'll destroy the wisdom of the wise. I'll take the cleverness of the clever and I'll set it aside. And boy, did he do that that night. You think you're a world superpower? You think you've got something going on? Whew, you're dead. <laughs> That's what God did that night. And it's an amazing story to study. So God promises, look, he promises always to be with his people. He fights our battles, right? We sing songs like that, don't we? Do you believe that song when we sing it? He fights our battles? Because this is what he's done for his people down through time. He fights them. And we learn to obey him and trust him. And look, sometimes Christians are tempted to try to solve our problems by fighting and battling over issues that only the power of God can save. Anybody ready to go take on the whole new, whatever this is called up there, administration stuff? I mean, the war on God is happening. Look, we just came from California. You know what month it is. It's Pride Month. In fact, just hours ago, not too many hours ago, we were in San Francisco. <laughs> you, there's a full-out attack on God. It's hatred towards what he has designed. And it's prevalent, <laughs> out west in, in so many ways. Who's going to fight that battle? Do you think you're going to just march out there and tell millions of people that are out there going, oh yeah, finally we have our freedom. God fights our battles for us. We preach humbly, but we preach the truth. We stand on the word of God because he has the power to take on those who think they're so clever, those who think they're so wise, 
God destroys that. He promises those things. Proverbs 14, 12 says this. Love this verse. This is the way which seems right to a man. There's a way that seems right to a man. But in the end, it is the way of death. It's the way of death. They think this is the way. Oh, finally, we have our freedom. We can do whatever we want. We can, this is who I am. <laughs> well, of course it is who you are. You're deprived. I, what would I be if it wasn't for the salvation of God, right? But we see the power of God who can thwart any of that. He has the ability to do it. I want you to turn to James chapter 3. I was in this passage the other day preparing for this, and I was just kind of overwhelmed by this passage. It's written to the early church, and it's so suitable for today. Chapter 3, verse 13 reads this way. Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. See, that's the result of the gospel. Our wisdom now becomes gentle. Look, we're not here to try to change the government. I, I think Christians have to be careful of that. That's not our job. This thing is so big and so massive and moving so quickly, this moral decay within our nation. Our job is to teach wisdom gently. See, I love that verse. Teach wisdom gently. This is what God says about marriage. We love God and we love you and we want you to hear this truth. This is the result of it. But see, there's those who claim to be wise and understanding and so they have a different way of doing things. God's saying, no, no, if you truly understand my truth, you'll teach with gentleness of wisdom. Look at verse 14. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant so as to lie against the truth. Well, if you have bitter jealousy, now think about this. There's a bitter jealousy against God. They don't like the Bible. They don't like what the Word of God says about marriage and family and life and all that God's Word handles because it has everything for everything we have in life and godliness. They don't like it. And so there's this bitter jealousy. There's a selfish ambition that rises up in the heart of man. And in the end, what they do is lie against truth. Evolution is taught every day in our public schools and many schools, isn't it? The Bible clearly says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So either God's a liar or you're a liar. One of the two. Somebody's lying. Because either God created all of everything, made it perfect, and it was good, and it was done, and it was complete, or you lie against truth. See, this is where worldly wisdom takes man. He has to, in the end, lie against God. He has to. Now notice what he says about that type of wisdom, verse 15. This is very, very stark and real. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above. Now notice the terms. But it is earthly, natural, and demonic. Wow. See, man left to himself, what does he come up with? He comes up with earthly wisdom. He comes up with natural wisdom, which is a fallen mind, a fallen heart, a fallen reasoning. And in the end, the Bible says that Satan's all involved in this. He loves false wisdom. He loves human wisdom, human wisdom that takes away from the authority of God in his word. Verse 16, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. What a contrast to the gospel. What a contrast. When jealousy, I want my way, I want my freedoms, I want to do what I want to do, I want to be who I am. You know what that leads to? The Bible says every evil thing. You know the opposite of that is the gospel? You know what the gospel has done? It's brought hundreds of people together in this room to hear the word of God today, who are like-minded. It's brought us into unity it's brought us into loving one another and caring for one another. It's brought us under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Look what the gospel does. The gospel brings people together. The word of God brings us together to love one another and to honor one another. Guess what worldly wisdom does? Separates. Because everybody has their thoughts, right? And that was what was going on in Paul's day in Corinth. They all followed their leaders. They were even doing that church. Well, I follow Paul. I follow Apollos. I follow Cephas, right? See, that's where earthly wisdom gets you. Separation, division. The gospel brings us together, tightens us together, 
causes us to love Christ, his word, in one another. Notice that in verse 17. But the wisdom from above is first pure. You know what that's doing? It's contrasting to the false wisdom, the impurity of human wisdom. Man, if you want to live on Fox News or CNN or whatever, you are just getting impure wisdom. Just impure. It's stained by what man thinks and what man can come up with in his depravity. You're not going to get purity. You turn to God's word, you get purity. And notice the result of it. I love this. Peaceful. It's peaceable. People live within peace with one another. I love our family, our church family. It's not that we're not perfect here, and those maybe watching online and maybe don't live here, we, we certainly are not a perfect church. But I'll tell you what, this church loves one another. And we weep with one another, and we rejoice with one another. Our church is at peace. There's, nobody, there's no big fights and quarrels and, and divisions among us. You know why? Because the gospel is preached here. Because the word of God is held in high honor. That, that makes it peaceable around here. There's a gentleness and if maybe you're struggling in sin, someone comes to you and says, hey, brother, hey, sister, I love you. Come on, can I help you with this? I, I know, I've been there. I, I've, I've struggled with sin. See, there's a gentleness about us. That's what the gospel does. It's, it's reasonable. We reason in the scriptures. We reason together in God's word. And, and so we can come up and it's reasonable, right? Because God is a God of justice and order. And, and so he gives us a reasonable way to live in this life. Notice it's full of mercy. There's mercy in the gospel. There's no mercy if you cross the lines of what the popular opinion is out there. They will destroy you. <laughs> there's no mercy out there. There's, there's no, I mean, they talk about, you know, um, political correctness and all that stuff, but as soon as you cross the line and you teach what the Bible teaches, oh no, that's all gone. That's all gone. There's no mercy. We are full of mercy because God has shed mercy on us. Notice there's good fruits. Good fruit is great. One of the things about being in California is we enjoyed the fruit of California. There's so much fruit being ripened out there, and it's a very, very fertile area, and we just enjoyed such fresh fruit out there. It's, you can smell it. You can go buy a strawberry stand, or you can go buy a melon field out there. You can smell it out there, and you go, wow, that smells good. See, that's the mark of good soil. And when we study God's word, we're in good soil. Notice it's unwavering. I love this. The gospel's unwavering. The gospel doesn't go like this around the social issues. <laughs> the gospel goes right through the social issues. Someone once said to me, well, I was born this way. I said, well, I was born a liar and a cheat. So we're both sinners. <laughs> the gospel's for you. Yes, you have a same-sex attraction. You have a sinful issue in your life. I was born a liar. I had a sinful issue in my life. Born a sinner. God saves us. Let's do it God's way. There's no other hope for you. Is this correct? Do you believe this? See, don't fall into those lies. Those are, those are, those are wavering. They're, they're, they're turning with the tides of, of humanity and depravity. We stick to the gospel. It cuts through all of this. Oh, praise the Lord for the unwavering gospel. And notice that we cannot live as hypocrites. We have the ability not to be hypocrites. Oh, sure, we may fall and we may sin from time to time. But guess what we get to do? We get to repent. We get to go to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ and say, Lord, thank you for dying for that sin. I'm so sorry. Will you forgive me? And you can be right with the Lord and right with others. And so we don't have to live as hypocrites. We don't have to blame shift it onto everybody else. We can own our own sin and, and be right and pure before the Lord. Isn't that beautiful? Look at verse 18. And the seeds whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. You know, there's no greater peacemakers than people who know the gospel. Man, you're a peacemaker. Think about what you can offer somebody. You can offer somebody that they no longer have to be at war with God. Because the opposite of peace is what? War. So you can offer that to people. You can say, I can be at peace. You can walk into somebody's life. You can help them with their marriage, with their parenting, with their business decisions. And you can offer truth of God's word of how to do things according to God's way and bring peace into their life while they struggle with their own flesh. Oh, this is, this is what Paul is talking about. This is what the foolishness of the gospel is to the world. They don't see that we have the answers to all of life's issues through the word of God, through the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, second, we can, 
You cannot boast in both worldly wisdom and in the cross of Christ. You can't boast in both of those. Look at verse 20. He goes, where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of the world? Well, here now the Apostle Paul is proving that the human worldly wisdom is unreliable. <laughs> he's proving, he's going to prove if you hold to the worldly wisdom, it's going to fail you. It's going to fail you every time. And notice he starts to expose these fallacies through a series of questions. First he says, where's the wise men? Where, where's the wise men? Hey, where are those guys who designed the Tower of Babel? <laughs> Oh, we're going to be like God. Let's build this big building. Let's get up into the sky. We'll be like God. What happened to those guys? God says, oh, yeah, I changed your language. Well, that project never, end, never finished. I mean, think about that. That was somebody's brainchild. Let's be like God. Where are those guys now? What happened to them? We'll just go a little further. How about the wise men of Egypt? We're getting blood, frogs, gnats lightning, you know, I mean, they, how did you match that? So God takes a frog, a little hoppy guy, and he defeats a nation with it. What are they doing? We'll create more. <laughs> we can do the same thing, and through sorcery and demonic stuff they, or magic, they try to create more of them. But in the end, even those wise men said, Pharaoh, we're going to die. Their God's stronger than us. I mean, just think about this down, down through the ages. I was, I was reading in the Old Testament, and um, the, Phil the Philistines had captured the Ark of the Covenant, and they took them to their, their temple where Dagon was, and they danced around Dagon, their wooden little idol guy, and, and said, oh, Dagon does this and all that. And the next day, they come out, Dagon's on his face before the, before the Ark of God. And they set him back up, and they go to bed, and they get up the next morning. Where is he at? <laughs> down again. You know, somewhere along the line, I would have thought, I think we're worshiping the wrong idol here, at least. And see, where are they now? Moving to Acts chapter 17. Paul walks into the Mars Hill there. What a beautiful scene that was, right? He goes in there, and here's all these idols to all these gods. And then he comes to this unknown god. And he says, look, all these other guys have failed you. Let me tell you about this unknown god. It takes the wisest men, the Athenians, right? And teaches them about the Lord Jesus Christ and how God had made their ways. It just goes on and on. Think about the philosophers like Aristotle and Plato. Guess where they're at? Dead, waiting judgment. Think about university professors who mock the Bible and mock Christians who come in and stand for life and write a paper on life begins in the womb. And they get destroyed for it. Think about those. Where is their wisdom going to take them what about the media now that controls free speech? I'm probably knocked off of Facebook by now, I imagine. Um, uh, who, who, do they, who do they before God? The Bible says he'll, he'll take their cleverness and set it aside. He'll destroy their wisdom. Oh, brother and sister, do not hold to these people. They will only lead you astray. And brothers and sisters, watch your own self. How many issues this week came up in your life that you try to tackle without the scriptures. Maybe a, a spat between you and your spouse. Maybe a disagreement about the children. Maybe a financial decision that you had. How many decisions did come up before you and you did not think biblically of how to solve them? See, it's dangerous. And what Paul's trying to do is help us realize, quit leaning on earthly wisdom, human wisdom. It will fail you every time. Notice he goes on, where's the scribe? <laughs> oh, I really like this one. I wrote my notes. In other words, where are those who can pen the words of life that can change a person's eternal destiny? Where are those people? Oh, I wrote, you know, I, you know, I read this great book that Oprah put out. <laughs> yeah. Who's writing words that change your eternal destiny? Who's writing something that's infallible, um, inerrant, all-sufficient for everything? Who's writing that? No one. You can't compare the wisdom of man to the wisdom of God in any shape. They all fall before God's wisdom. Where's that scribe? 
Then he goes to the debater of the age. Where's the debater of the age? Well, the Greek word for debater is suzets, refers to one who argues about philosophy. And I think what Paul is doing here is he's being somewhat sarcastic by now, challenging them. Put forth your human wisdom. Where is that debater who can stand against God? And I think Paul is demonstrating that their clever arguments, their impressive rhetoric, can't satisfy the soul, and you're not better with them, you're better without them. Oh, brothers and sisters, be careful what you're following on social media. There's so much work to grab your mind going on. Trust the word of God. Paul is taking them on. And what he's teaching us here, the word of God is teaching us, is only the spirit can take the word of the cross and transform a heart of stone and make it a heart of flesh that loves God. I, I, there's so many Christian books out, and I do read my fair share, but I, I honestly think I can say I read my Bible more than I read any other book. I want the wisdom of God. I pray. And I think our church is continuing to grow that way. We love the Word of God. That's why we're here. I did not come, again, like I said earlier, I did not come and read all these articles and all this stuff and prepare a sermon. I spent my time studying God's Word and sharing that with you because that's what changes our lives. John Owen, when he was writing on this passage, one of his sermons, he said this, No man shall ever behold the glory of Christ by the sight in heaven who does not in some measure behold it by faith in this world. So in this world we see the glory of Christ is what he's after. On Christ's glory I would fix all my thoughts and all my desires. And, and the more I see the glory of Christ, the more I see the painted beauties of this world will wither away from my eyes and I will be, and I will be crucified to Christ and not crucified to this world. So he said, look, the more I grow, the more I study, the more I see the glory of Christ in this life and see who he is through the scriptures, the more I start to die to the things of the world. The more I begin to say, yeah, they don't have the answers. For the Christian, we have nothing more to boast in than the boast, the boast in Christ. Richard Sibbs, again, writing on this passage, he's a wonderful old gone-to-the-Lord theologian, said this, we can never attach too much importance to the atoning death of Christ. Remember the cross of Christ you're talking about. It is the leading fact in the word of God on which the eyes of our souls ought to be ever fixed. Without the shedding of his blood, there is no remissions of sin. It is the cardinal truth of which the whole system of Christianity hinges. Without it, the gospel is like an arch without a keystone, like a fair building without a foundation, a solar system without a sun. This, after all, is the master truth of Scripture that Christ died for sins. So let us daily return and let us daily feed our souls on the cross of Christ. Some, like Greeks of old, may sneer at the doctrine and call it foolishness. But let us never be ashamed to say with Paul, be it far from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, brothers and sisters, what are you boasting in? As I was out west, the church as there has been beat up. And they've been through a lot of political unrest. And some were holding to the scriptures, and yet others, all they want to do is talk about political things. So we try to steer that conversation back to the power of God. Back to the fact that no matter who's in office out there, they can't overpower the gospel. We have the most powerful thing in all the earth. So what will you boast about? What will you consider foolish? And do you see the truth of God's word as God's power. Third, our sovereign God in, and the wisdom of an only one way. Now, I wrote that kind of wordy, but I want you to think about that. Our sovereign God and the wisdom of only one way. Now look at verse 21. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. So in the wisdom of God, God knew that the wisdom of man couldn't bring them to God. You understand that? God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message to preach to those, to, uh, to save those who believe. Now, there are some people that said, well, it sounds like God changed a plan. No, no, this has always been his plan. Otherwise, it would delete or deny his sovereignty. So this verse, what it's teaching us here is that God was pleased to save people through his wisdom 
that is revealed in the cross and no other way. See, God was pleased to have a one way to him. He starts to illustrate this in the Bible, right? He's got an ark. You can come in the ark, but how many doors are there? I mean, the ark is a picture of our position in Christ, isn't it? We come in one way. He shuts the door. He holds us above judgment as he judges the entire world. He holds us. See, the Bible has always taught there's one way to God through faith alone. And so here, what he's doing is he says this, it pleased God to show the foolishness of the world that he made the simplistic, although profound, one way to God. See, Jesus Christ knew this. He said, John 14, 6, you all know this, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one, there's, there's no other way, there's no other person, there's no other, there's no other plan B. You only can come to the Father except through me. Now, that's even before his death. So he knew that the cross was, was the plan of God, and, and it would be foolish to the world, just like it was foolish to the people in Noah's day to say, what, it's going to rain? Oh, was Noah right? And God set that up. I love this word, well-pleased, here. Um, notice in the verse here that says that God was well-pleased through the foolishness of the message preached. Well, it has the idea that consider something as very good to, uh, not to take lightly. It, it shows uh, an approval. God approved this. And he had pleasure in this wisdom. And so this term, well-pleased, fixes his attention on God's free and sovereign choice, meaning it was not in God's plan at all that people would exercise their own wisdom in how to get to him. Did you catch that? I mean, you can see that in the verse. God was pleased to take man out of the process right? With a list. Well, you do this, you do this, you do this, you get me. It was pleased for him to say, that'll never work because they'll never do this, this. They can never live perfectly. So it was pleased for God to take the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ and make that the only way to him. He was pleased in that. And man has fought that ever since, haven't they? When you share the gospel with them, how many times has it happened? Well, you know, come on, I, I'm not like that guy. See, they're always matching themselves up to the world, which is in depravity. God says, look, it was pleasing to me to say, I'm not going to let you come to me man's way. I'm going to provide a single way to come through the Lord Jesus Christ alone. So people left to their own wisdom will always strive to create some kind of works righteousness plan. But Paul reminds us that it pleased God to reveal himself in quite a different way. And notice that Paul doesn't hesitate to bring out, I think, what seems like a total unexpectancy of this way by boldly proclaiming that it's foolish. He says, look, for since the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, but God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message. There's almost an unexpectancy, like, man, God did something we never would have thought. That's right, because left in your sin, you don't accept the gospel. Left in your sin, you go, well, that's kind of strange, believing a dead guy hanging on a cross. Doesn't that seem strange if you're not a Christian? And think about this. If you're Muslim, you know, if you're, if you're some ethnic group that hates Jews, I got to come through a Jew who claimed to be the son of God and claimed that he was incarnate and he's God, equal to God. I got to come through that. And he was hanging on a cross? See, left to yourself, that doesn't make sense, right? It's almost foolishness to you. Oh, but when God opens your eyes, when he opens your eyes, you're so excited about it, aren't you? Let me ask you a question. How many have been saved more than 10 years in here? 20, 30, 40, 50. Still a few hanging in here. <laughs> Let me ask you 40s and 50s. I'm talking to myself too. Is the cross any less glorious? How about you 30s and 20s? Does the cross get less glorious as you get older, or does it get greater? It gets greater, doesn't it? You know, so we go from, oh, Christianity. Some of you have told me the stories. Man, I thought Christians were the worst people on the earth. I thought they were the, only, they were the big problems. Now you're one of us. <laughs> and you look at Christ and his cross, and you worship with us. You sing those songs with all of your heart. Because cross, the cross of Christ has captured you, and you see it as glorious. And know, know just what Paul said, you see it as the power of God. You see the cross 
as the power of God. Oh, but left to your own self, you see it as foolish. You see it as foolish. See, this tells us that Paul was very well aware of what he was up against when he preached the gospel. He knew. He knew when he went to the streets of Corinth, when you go to the streets of Orlando or San Francisco or wherever you're going, you are up against people who are going to say, that's foolish. We reject you. We don't like your biblical view, and we want to get rid of you. Paul knew that. And guess what happened to him? He got beat, shipwrecked, snake, thrown in prison, whipped, <laughs> beaten, because he held without, uh, without ever being ashamed of the gospel. He held that straight line of the gospel, and he knew what he was going in. Verse 21, the word preach is an interesting word in there. Um, there are several Greek words that we, ta- we use for um, talking about proclamation or heralding. Probably the most, uh, the most used word in the New Testament is the word caruso. So I was thinking, well, that's what this word is. And I looked it up, and of course it wasn't. It says, that, notice it says, well, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Well, it uses a t- completely unique word. And the idea of this word is it says... It's the con- it means the content of a message. God was pleased to share the message of salvation with us. He was pleased to do this. He was pleased to show that, that man needs the Lord Jesus Christ. He needs a one way to him. Not just pro- proclaiming this. This is the central truth of the message. It is, it is what we preach about. Let me say this. Nobody gets saved because God preached. People get saved because of the message Scott preached or you preached or you shared with them. That's the difference in the word. Caruso is the proclamation of that message. This is talking about the saving message. So if you want to see people get saved, you teach the message of the gospel. Here's what I believe. I was born a sinner. I deserve the wages of death. But Jesus Christ came and died for my sins and hung on the cross. And God opened my eyes to see that. And I put my faith by God's grace in his son completely. So that's the gospel. Was that real difficult? Can you say that to somebody? See, that's proclaiming the truth of the gospel. That's what Paul is all about. Do you have the message correct? Number four. Got to hurry. Depravity demands everything but the gospel. Look at 22 and 23. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom. But we preach, here's Caruso, Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Gentiles foolishness. Well, Paul is, uh, in a very interesting way, is, is going to show that all of the world is trapped in depravity. And the gospel remains foolish to, to all of them, right? So in announcing, now let's think about this, in announcing that the Jews demand for signs over against the Greeks' quest for wisdom, Paul is bringing out the fallen characteristics of the entire world, right? So Jews would represent the nation of Israel. Greeks, Gentiles would represent the rest of the world. So Jews show very little interest in speculative uh, philosophy. They didn't care about in this day. They, they looked at all the Aristotles and um, Plato's and all that stuff, and they got, ah. You know what they wanted? They said, we demand evidence, show us matter-of-fact proof. That's what we want. In this course, this is what they did with Jesus, right? Mark chapter 8, verse 11. The Pharisees came out and began to argue with him, seeking him a sign from heaven to test him. John chapter 6. They came up to him and said, well, look, Moses gave us manna. And of course, Christ corrects him and says, no, Moses didn't give it, God did. And then they said this. What then do you do for a sign so that we may see and believe you what work you perform? Completely based on we're going to be saved by sight. We believe what? We are saved by faith alone. They believe we're saved by sight alone. So you can see such dramatic problems and you see that their view of the Messiah was one that would come and strike with power and majesty. And just like their forefathers before them, they desired signs and and wanted God, demanded God to deliver them. And when they didn't see them, they refused him, right? When they didn't get from God what they wanted, they refused him. And the nation fell into sin, just like the Pharisees. When they came to Jesus and did not get what they wanted from Jesus, they rejected him. 
And here, in the middle of all this, when you study these passages, you begin to realize they never saw themselves as sinners. And when you don't see yourself as a sinner, you're looking for some kind of wisdom or some kind of signs of some sort. This is why the charismatic and the prosperity gospel is so, so powerful in this country. Because you're not looking as a sinner. You're looking to get something. That's not true Christianity. Now, the Greeks, on the other hand, they were absorbed with speculative, theolo- uh, speculative philosophy, right? They, were, they loved to honor names and people and great thinkers. And this caused them to look down and despise others who didn't appreciate wisdom. And they mocked other cultures who lacked wisdom. So when Paul comes into Athens, uh, the verse says this in Acts chapter 17, verse 21. I love this verse. It says, now all the Athenians and the strangers visiting there used to spend their time in nothing other than telling and hearing of new things. <laughs> so they just get together and go, well, what do you know? Well, what do you know? Well, what do you know? And that, that was how they gained their way of living, the way they thought and the way they were going to make decisions, by human wisdom. What a mess. <laughs> and then a bunch of them get saved. One of the things the Greeks used to do is they didn't like people who couldn't speak well. So if you couldn't public speak, you were kind of you know, down there. And they made up a term for a lot of people who struggled with language. They called them barbarians. Now, certainly there was a group that became barbarians, but that was a term they used regularly. Because to them, who didn't speak well, you were just bar, bar, blah, 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 blah. You know, the sitcom didn't come up with that, right? They, this is something they thought. So think about this. They looked at everybody down. Now, here comes Christ. He starts saving people. And, and Christ starts drawing people to himself through the Apostle Paul's preaching. And people from every walk of life are getting saved. Listen to Colossians chapter 3, verse 11. There is no distinction between Greek and Jew. There's the first group that we talked about. Circumcised and uncircumcised. Now listen to this. Barbarian, Scythian. Scythian were bloodthirsty, I mean, some of the meanest people in the world. Slave and free men, but Christ is all and in all. So Paul says, when Christ comes in the glory of the cross, you see the power of God in the glory of Christ, in the cross of Christ, you see the power of God in the cross of Christ, it brings all together. So in the church of, Col- of Colossae was barbarians and Scythians, slave and masters. They were all there together serving the Lord together because Christ brought them together. What a beautiful thing the gospel is. And what wickedness is when man holds to just human wisdom. Look at verse 23 with me. I love this. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Gentiles uh, a foolishness. Now... <laughs> Verse 23, just as a great contrast here. Notice he uses this aversive conjunction. I love, I love it when Paul uses these. He says, but. Now, I mean, the last one is just the Jews want signs, the Greeks want wisdom. Everybody's going to hell in a handbasket kind of verse, right? But here he says, but, wait, but we. Ooh, wait a minute, that's a plural pronoun. Guess what he's doing? He's, in, he's bringing us into the scene now. But we. Believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, those who see the cross as not foolish, but as the power of God, that's who we proclaim. Now he goes back to Caruso. He uses the Greek word Caruso. That's who we herald to the world. Oh, this is missions now, right? This is what we do. See, we are not seeking signs. We're not seeking some worldly wisdom. We want to proclaim Jesus. He's the only hope for the world. Fox News needs it, CNN needs it, Pride Group needs it. They all, all those who are apart from Jesus need the cross of Christ. And Paul, I love this verse, says, look, we preach Christ crucified. But he's a realist too, notice what he says. To the Jews, major stumbling block. Major stumbling block. What? That guy who hung on a cross? No, no, our Messiah comes and he wipes out our enemies. That can't be it. There's no way. And they fall over him. 1 Peter chapter 2. Oh, I wrote it in my notes somewhere. 2, verse 4 through 8. You begin to see that Jesus Christ is this appointed stumbling block to the Jews. He does not fit the suit. You get that? Jesus did not fit the suit. And so he is stumbled over. But that's not who we... We see him as glorified. And that's... We proclaim Jesus. 
to the Jews, to the Gentiles. Oh, you don't have to stumble over them. Confess your sins, repent, turn to Jesus. He's the one way. He's the plan of God. He's the power of God. There's no other way. Come to him. Oh, that's the proclamation that we do. Notice that to the Greeks that he is but foolishness. He is but foolishness. So the Jews would only see the gospel message as foolish. They would see a crucified Messiah, a Messiah and just stumble over him. The Greek, he wasn't any better. He would just see the foolishness of thinking that a God, a God or the God could become man. In that he would come and he would humble himself and let men kill him. Oh, we can't believe that's foolish. Gods don't do that. And they would reject him and die in their sins. But listen, the crucifixion is at the heart of the Christian faith. Every one of us that are saved in here, this is our message. This is the power of God and we hold to it. And they'll mock us till God returns, I promise. They'll mock you for believing in this. That we believe in Jesus Christ is the only way. There is nothing now in the world about exclu exclusivity. That's not right. To believe in one way is too narrow. And that'll bring them after us. Because we believe in marriage, the Bible's way. We believe in parenting, the Bible's way. We believe in society, God's way, right? That's too narrow for them. That's all foolishness. Oh, but to us, uh, to us we see the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Last thought, and I'll tackle this more next week. Um, but number five, Christ is the pers uh, personified power and wisdom of God. Look at verse 24 just briefly here. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. There are some precious things that are in this phrase here. If, if people are in their depravity, whether Jew or Gentile, instinctively they reject the message of the cross and, and they perish. But when people who are the called of God, whether they're Jew or Gentile or barbarian or Scythian or whatever they may be, the grace of God is profoundly welcomed. See, that's the mark of a changed person. We profoundly welcome this grace of God seen in the gospel. It's overwhelming to us. It wakes us up in the morning. It helps us think through how we make decisions. And notice where the called, that's just a beautiful phrase in that verse. Notice it there. Where the called in verse 24. Paul places the emphasis of the, of the text on that phrase, the called. Because all other signs and human wisdom are, are really foolish compared to the effectual calling of God. I mean, can you imagine someone coming in here and saying, you guys are wrong. You're wrong. You're not saved by the cross. We would go, oh, uh, I'm sorry to make a difference with you. You'll have to kill me first before I ever deny that salvation comes through Jesus Christ in his cross alone. I mean, we are sold out to it, aren't we? That's the mark of a Christian. That, that's the cult. And, and so we, we hold to this truth and we realize that God's powerful plan was set down before the foundations to rescue us. And he called us out of darkness. And he called us by his power and strength. And think about that power. And I said this earlier, but I want to say it one more time. Where else will you find power that will save you from your sin? That will save you from hell? That will save you from Satan? That will save you from darkness? Where, where, tell me, can you, can you buy that power? Where can you get that from? See, Paul is urging us to turn to the cross of Jesus Christ to find our strength. And though the cross was foolish to the Gentile world, yet God caused the cross where his own son hung on it for the elect to prove his power. That's how he proved his power. And look, the world just thinks it's foolish. They think it's foolish. Well, in closing, again, we'll come back to this. The last thought is the weakness of our safe, suffering Savior is the power of God on display. And, and I'll, I'll jump in next week with these two verses that I'm finishing on to give a fuller understanding of it. But notice verse 25 just briefly. Because the foolish of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Well, what Paul is doing here is he's giving a strong statement about the real wisdom of God and the real foolishness of mankind. In other words, what mankind thinks is foolish, God says is wiser 
than anything they could come up with. And a suffering servant like our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, hangs on a cross, only appears, listen to this, only appears foolish and weak to the loss. But to us, it's the most powerful thing that's ever existed. Amen? Amen. Well, let me close with just a little bit of a challenge. I thought about this on my trip as I was just doing lots of fun things. I was thinking about just application to this. I, I don't think anyone in here who claims to be a Christian thinks the cross is foolish. But let me, let me put it into an everyday existence. How does the crucified Savior impact your relationship with your spouse? See, we say the cross is the power of God and it's foolishness to those who are perishing. But there are times in our life, and I want us to stop here and admit these things and talk with the Lord about these, because there's times in our lives where we say, Lord, I don't need you in this area. I'm not going to look to your word in this. I'm going to handle this myself. Isn't that foolish? Didn't we say earlier we'd made a list of things that Maybe we went through this week and we never, never even looked to the Bible to see what it said. Isn't that foolish? So though this is talking about in a salvific, salvific way that the lost see the cross as foolish and, and the saved see it as the power of God, I think at times we demonstrate that we think or live out a foolish look at the cross. If I am going through a struggle in relationships, finances, uh, work, whatever it may be, and I never turn to the gospel, that's pretty foolish, isn't it? So let me close with this. What's in your life right now? Every one of us have things in our life that are difficult. Will you search God's word? Will you look for God's word for the answer? And if you can't find it, will you go find somebody, someone who knows the Bible, And say, will you help me solve this issue through the scriptures? See, what I'm saying gently and kindly is don't be foolish. God has given you his word. He does not want us struggling out there trying to wade our way through this crazy world. He's given us an all-sufficient scripture. Don't be a foolish believer. Amen? Amen? Father, thank you for your love for us. You're so kind to us. You have debunked the world time and time again, and you will continue to do it. There's nothing greater than your word. There's no scribe out there that can pen words of life that give us eternal life with you, Lord. And so we must be careful what we read. There's no one out there who speaks or proclaims something that gives us the right to eternal life with you, Lord. So we need to be careful what we hear, Lord. Father, there's no one out there who can beat the arguments of the Scriptures because they come up against the all-sufficient Word of God. So, Lord, turn our ears, our hearts, our minds toward your Word of God because the cross is the power of God and the cross is the pinnacle of the Word of God. So, Lord, help us in that. May we find great joy and satisfaction searching the Scriptures of how to live this life. Lord, please use the message of the cross to save people. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand with me for a closing benediction? Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your grace and mercy that you have shined in our lives. We praise you that you chose to take what man calls foolish and revealed through the cross the only way of salvation. We thank you that you did not ask us to save ourselves through our own wisdom, but provided the way through your crucified Son. Now, Lord, may we take up our own cross and follow your Son into eternity. Amen?